It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the program. With me in the KFG studios, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Yes, well, Social Security did not become taxable until 1984. And while only a few folks paid taxes on it at that time, more and more people are having to include it in their taxable income each year. Aware of that trend, what can you do today to avoid having to pay tax on your Social Security in the future? We're sharing our strategies and more on this week's episode. Don't you love that? I, I would love to just find, I, I guess I a lot of financial planning, if you will, is trying to figure out how you can pay the least amount of tax over your lifetime. That's a phrase that I think Kevin uh, originated. And, and this one in particular, right, to set yourself up on a glide path so that for most of your retirement, you're not needing to worry about tax on your Social Security. That's a big deal. We're helping with that right now. If you have a question for the program, we'd love to hear from you. Have any needs or issues? We're here to help. You can call or text 574 222 2000. That's 574 222 2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. So, you guys know if you're a fan of the Wise Money Show, uh, how this really grinds my gears. <laughs> it just gets it just gets me fired up. So listen, you pay into the Social Security system uh, with that uh, four letter F word tax, FICA, okay, uh, Federal Insurance Contribution Act, and FICA is that a deduction? Do you get to deduct the tax that you pay? Is that a is that a taxable deduction? No, it's not. It's after tax money that you're using to pay into FICA, and then when you receive that money back in Social Security benefits. They're going to tax you again. Yeah, and as long hey, as long as we're geeking out a little bit, it's FICA is it's two components. Yeah. There's six point two percent that the employee pays and six point two percent that the employer pays. So that's twelve point four. And we're not supposed to do numbers or math on the radio, but that's twelve point four, and that's limited. You're going to pay that six point two, and your employer will pay that. So really, you're paying twelve point four on the first hundred and forty. No, that's the thing. It was 147. It's going up to 160 now. Yeah, 160, of course. So uh, <laughs> makes sense. Right? Isn't that what I said? So well, and I'm stuck back. I'm really stuck in the 80s, but professionally, I'm stuck in the 90s. And my brain says, emotionally, where are you stuck? <laughs> uh, the wardrobe. Or, uh... <laughs> I think I'm about seven mostly. <laughs> no, but but uh, so. It was 60000 when I first got in the business. And so they've increased that number that I pay 6.2 and my employer pays 6.2 on from 60000 in 1995, let's say, to 160. 160 next year. So your taxes are going up. Okay. And but wait, it gets better. There's, yeah. there's more, Mike. I know. So it's not just the, the 6.2 and 6.2. There's the 1.45 and 1.45, which pays for Medicare. Mm -hmm. And that is unlimited. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how much you make, income-wise, you pay taxes, 1.45 and 1.45 on all that. So total, 15.3 on the first 160, and then it just drops down to the... 2.9. And that drives every worker crazy, right? The thought of paying into this system and especially those that are younger and wondering, am I going to get any kind of payout out of this system? Yeah. I'm funding it for other people. Like it, it's a common complaint. But how often do we have to be the bearer of bad news to explain to a brand new retiree, hey, all that money that you've been paying into the social security system, as you start drawing it out, this may be taxable to you. Right. And yeah, it, it doesn't go over real well, you know, uh, ma makes you an unpopular delivery guy when you're teaching that concept to people. No, it doesn't make sense that it, for, for a dollar that I pull out of my retirement plan, there's either 50 cents or 85 cents that comes over from Social Security for me to pay taxes on as well. So, okay, so how's that calculation work? So it's, it's a confusing calculation. We've shared it before multiple times on shows. Let's hit it again. Well, essentially, when you get to retirement and you are uh, living life normally and you start Social Security up, they're going to do a calculation that says, all right, let's total up all of your sources of income from everything. Mm -hmm. um, 
minus any deductions that you were able to take, and that's called your adjusted gross income. I'm giving a very generic definition of that. But from there, then they start adding back some other things that normally don't even show up on your tax return. For example, the interest that you earn on uh, tax-free bonds. So tax-free interest gets added back in, and then half of your Social Security benefits. And so there's this, this weird calculation that they call a combined income, and they use that to measure against certain thresholds to determine, are you eligible to receive this Social Security tax-free? Do you not have to count it on your tax return? And unfortunately, those thresholds are not really that high, and they haven't been changing at all either, which is a big deal. If you're an individual filing just a single tax return, once your income, that combined calculation that we were talking about, goes over $25,000, you are going to have to start counting more of your Social Security on the return. Once you get up to $34,000, you are halfway. You are counting 50% of your Social Security. And you can keep on going up from there. Everyone caps out eventually at 85% of their Social Security if their income gets that high. That's for single filers, married, filing jointly. It begins at 32, so it's not even double, right? right? It's 32,000 right. and sliding scale. That's when Social Security starts becoming taxable. That's a pretty small runway, guys. But here's the thing, and we, we did a show about this recently, and we're going to launch off of this. But... Josh, you said something very kindly, much more uh, kind than I would have, that we're all, you know, the, our society has inflation. I'll just start with that. There's, we're in an inflationary society, and we sort of need it that way for a variety of reasons. I don't know how deep to go down the rabbit hole. Don't. Okay. Um, but there's a cost of living adjustment each year to your Social Security based on some mysterious measure of the urban CP lie. Okay. Um, so there's an increase in your Social Security that's just happening naturally, funded by taxpayers, blah, blah, blah. But that formula, that 25000 threshold of this combined income, that's never changed, mm -hmm. ever. They started taxing Social Security in, what would you say, Kevin? 1984. 1984, but 8%. There was a big change in 1993. Okay. And that's where it... it the, the because it, from 1984 to 1993, not a lot of people were paying taxes. I'm, I believe, and I've heard it said, it was the largest tax increase in the history of the world in 1993 when they when they instituted that, it, about, that tax on Social Security. Mm. Uh, about eight percent when originally it was introduced. About eight percent of people joined Social Security paid tax on it. This year is 56 percent, and they had projected that that would continue to rise with modest inflation. Guys, next year it's going to be a significant more. I mean, the the majority of people that draw Social Security will have to pay have to pay tax on it. That's right. If your income keeps going up, but the threshold doesn't, more and more people are going to trigger that that milestone on their income and start having to count more of their Social Security. Yeah, it's interesting. I went back and assumed, okay, well, with this logic, with this logic that well, these numbers don't change. So what if? What if other parts of the tax code didn't change from back to 1983? Your IRA contribution next year, next year you're able to contribute $6,500 to your IRA, another thousand if you're if you're experienced in life, age 50 or older. <laughs> back in 1983, you could only put 1,500 bucks in there. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you could still only put 1,500 bucks in there. Well, what about your 401k contribution? How much could you put in that back in 1983? They weren't even using 401ks for retirement at that point. <laughs> it had just been put into the Internal Revenue Code, and no one was using it yet as a retirement vehicle. It was just a few years after 1983 when people started to, and your contribution limit was seven grand. This upcoming year, it'll be, what, 22500 And so it is baffling that they haven't increased this, this threshold at which, well, is, if your income's above this, then you need to draw, you know, ha have your Social Security land on your tax return. It's just a sneaky way for them to increase taxes. That's exactly right. It's uh, slowly but surely more and more people are being affected by this tax. And those are the, if you're a politician, those are the best ways to introduce a, a new tax over time, right? Yeah. Slowly and kind of hidden where most people, you know, they, they don't cry foul when it first comes out, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so ultimately, you're, what, we're going to see inflation. Um, you know, potentially continue to go down. Although back in, you know, the, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we had a triple top inflation. It peaked and then it came down 
and then it peaked and it came down and then it went back up. I, I sure hope that's not what we see. You know, who who knows? But 8.7% increase on your on your uh, Social Security for this upcoming year. When you've got that and you've got to draw more out of your other retirement accounts to keep up with inflation, likely you're going to have to pay more tax. So what can you do right now? This is the big question. What can you do right now to avoid, to put yourself in a position to avoid paying tax on your Social Security in the future? We're helping solve that and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show. You're at the Wise Money Show channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Turn on notifications. If you like the content, like the content. This is our one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, every Saturday morning, also on podcast as well, also on a couple of radio stations in our area, which is why the content's broken up the way that it is. But for more direct content, we've got Next Y Step videos that air all throughout the work week, about 10 minutes long, taking one financial concept, applying it directly to your financial life. So if you've got a financial issue, a question, something you're dealing with, or just looking for some perspective, odds are we've created content about it. So Make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, leave comments below. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay. So it is, it is interesting. Our, this is of course bonus content, but our current president, um, helped with the whole, um, taxation of social security. So he, so what was the change in the nineties? Well, okay. So, um, in 1983, Joe Biden was one of 88 senators who voted for a bipartisan bill. So basically the whole Senate to tax up to 50% of Social Security for beneficiaries with income above a certain threshold. So this is the confusing thing. Even now, and I don't know if we hit this on the radio show portion or not, because when you, as soon as you talk about so the taxation of your Social Security benefits, people automatically, it seems like uh, people automatically go to, okay, well, all my benefit is going to be gone because right. I'm it's being taxed. Yeah. Or you say, no, 85% of your benefit will be taxed. And so what do they hear? Mm -hmm. My right. benefit is going to be taxed at an 85% tax rate. Yeah. So, so this is where communication um, and clarity is so important. And it, it's so lacking. And this is where, because Josh said in the last segment that, you know, it drives workers crazy. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. Because if it drove, if workers fully understood it and it really drove them crazy, there'd be a revolt. Haven't and, you seen some of those uh, videos, though, <laughs> where, where dad gives son his first paycheck and the son opens it and goes crazy? Who's FICA? <laughs> I've seen like and I'm assuming some of those might be staged but if so those kids should be actors cuz pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I it, think clarifying that right now. So Kevin. in in 1993 it was a it was a 50-50 tie. Because there there is some stuff floating around the interwebs saying that Biden was the deciding vote for blah 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 and it's not true um but he did um because of his long career uh, serving our country in the Senate um, have two chances to vote on the taxation of Social Security. And so actually the, 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 the tie-breaking vote was cast by Al Gore in 1993. And that's where they, that's where they raised the, um, it added another bracket to the income thresholds and increased the portion of benefits eligible to be taxed if the recipient exceeded the second tier thresholds. Under this bill, single recipients with income under 34 and married under 44 could pay up to 85. And that's the part tax, that hasn't changed. Tax on, right. But so the f I mean, what what's the next step? You you take it all the way up to 100% and right. all of your social security is counted. That's right. 125%. Let's explain that, Kevin, succinctly, and then we'll get into <laughs> that real issue. Wait, which part? Because the, there's nothing succinct about what we just said. <laughs> no, the, the, you know, just because your Social Security is taxed, don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, like, okay, so. The 80, what? Clear as mud. Yep. The 85% gotcha. <laughs> tax that, 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 that I pay big, on my. Yeah, the big misconception yeah. that a yeah. lot of people struggle okay. with. All right, here we go. 
how can you set yourself up to avoid paying tax on your Social Security out there in the future? We've helped many people with this. We're helping people with it right now. I want to help you with it. Uh, this is the Wise Money Show with Cohorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Cohorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel as well as a lot of other content. Go check it out. Go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show, and subscribe to the channel there. Uh, all right, so talking about Social Security and and we were breaking down how it's taxed, might have hurt your feelings. Now, what can you do to avoid having to pay tax on it out there in the future? Before we get into that, Kevin, a couple common misconceptions when you talk about Social Security and taxes. Yes, and it's it, it's very easy to get confused about how this works. And you say, well, it's not, we understand how it works well because this is what we do all day, every day. Um, but most folks, if they don't, if they actually have a life, they d- they don't understand how this works. So when you say, well, your Social Security is going to be taxed, what a lot of folks hear is, okay, I'm basically giving back my Social Security. That's partially true. It's not true, though. So think in terms of thresholds. So if I receive a certain amount of Social Security and my income is above a certain threshold, a portion of my Social Security will go over and increase my taxable income. Right. It will become taxable. It isn't, you know, pulled away as tax. You're right. Taken from you. Right. Yeah. And then you say, well, you, you're going to, there are a couple of thresholds. There's a 50% threshold. Um, and so people hear, okay, well, I'm going to pay 50% tax on my Social Security. No. Think in terms of if I got $20,000 of Social Security benefits, 50% of that could be taxable. So maybe 10000 goes over and increases my taxable income. Right. And if then if you're in the 12% tax bracket, 1200 bucks is the actual tax. And if you have an income, let's say your retirement income is in the range of 100000 I tell people, we'll just plan on paying tax on all of your Social Security. So, and that's, that's not... That's not accurate. It's not true because you will only ever pay tax on 85 cents of every dollar that you receive in Social Security. And so, again, what people hear is, okay, I'm paying an 85% tax on my Social yeah. Security. No. <laughs> and and this is why I, I try to not even say it in Josh's. I, I'm actually, I'm having a flashback to, there, there was a time that Kevin and I were meeting with a brand new client. They weren't even truly clients yet. And uh, he was explaining the 85% cap on Social Security. And one of the couple, um, they just lost it. Like, you mean I'm going to lose 85% of my Social Security to the tax man? And uh, it it took some kind of like calming down and reassuring and re-explaining that, no, up to 85% of your Social Security can be counted on the tax return. How much tax you pay on that social security is determined by all the same factors of everyone's uh, tax return. What tax bracket are you in? What are your deductions? That that kind of thing. So it's, it's not as bad as some people may react. Um, It's not as bad, but it's not as simple as you want it to, because it's not based on a number that is readily available to your eyes. It's based on a modified adjusted gross income, which is uh, IRS code speak for you can't get there from here. <laughs> and so and so this is this is where we we you know our penchant from taking the very simple and breaking it down and making it very complex comes in and um we just really it, it's it, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, here's the thing. In order to like how can you avoid paying tax on your social security? Most states, I don't know if it's all, it's got to be stinking close to all. Uh, most takes most states do not tax Social Security, so there you go. Um, you don't have to pay FICA tax on your Social Security. That's good. <laughs> that's good. You don't have to pay Social Security tax on your Social Security. Um, but federal income tax. Mm-hmm. What can you do right now? This show, the Wise Money Show, is about financial planning, comprehensive financial planning. So it's not just us, you know, belly aching around on on the radio and saying, "Well, this is something to get all fired up about." No, no, no. What action can you take today? Being proactive. And 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 planful. You're welcome, Kevin. What can you do? Oh. What can you do right now to set yourself up so that you avoid paying tax on your Social Security? The big idea is, well, don't have a lot of income show up on your tax return. Well, okay, well that that's 
I, that's nice to say. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but isn't financial planning about wanting more income out in the future? I want right. to live a better lifestyle. So, so what can you do? The first is the magical Roth IRA. And there's several ways that the Roth can help you, but let's get into that. Yeah, the, the magic of the Roth IRA is that you pay tax on the money as you earn it, make the contribution to this awesome retirement account, and let it grow for years, maybe decades. And as it's growing, it's not only avoiding being taxed along the way because it is a tax shelter, but when you get to retirement and you draw these dollars out, you get to receive that as income to yourself that's not countable on the tax return. Mm -hmm. It's tax-free income to you, which means if, if you followed any of that calculation we were describing in the, in the first segment, um, the, the, the calculation that determines whether Social Security is going to be counted, Roth distributions, the money you pull out of your Roth IRAs doesn't impact that calculation. We even before the show even before the show, guys, we we double checked because it I wouldn't put it past him. I would not put it past him to someday add this into the calculation that, well, yes, there's this mysterious calculation. And part of that mysterious calculation is you have to add in your Roth distributions and that counts. Uh, not yet. Not not that I'm seeing, you know, but uh you know we'll, we'll see. But right now the Roth IRA stuffing as much money as possible into the Roth IRA and living off of that to supplement your Social Security shouldn't cause your Social Security to become taxable because it doesn't land on your tax return. And there are, there are really two ways to get money into a Roth IRA. One is to contribute, and there are some phase-outs income-wise that you, you, you're, you'd be subject to. So one is a contribution. I can do that annually. I've got a coupon for how much I can. And the other is to convert. So I take IRA money and move it to a Roth IRA money. Likely that IRA money's never had any taxes paid on it. So when I convert it from IRA to Roth IRA, I pay the taxes because only after tax money can ever go into a Roth IRA. But it gets better. There's more. So you say, well, I have a Roth IRA. Yes, but many people have a Roth 401k. Mm -hmm. So you've got two different buckets or two different coupons, if you will. So you say, well, next year I could do, in 2023, I can do 6500 plus $1,000 catch-up. So I could do 7500 into my Roth IRA if I... As it, long as my income's below, what is it, 214 or something, something yeah. crazy like that. Or yeah. if I'm doing a backdoor Roth IRA. Um, so that is an option. Mm -hmm. And I can do 22500 into a 401k. And I, I, I make the selection. I toggle the switch between pre-tax, so I get the benefit up front, or post-tax, think Roth, and I get the benefit in retirement. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're, wait a second, if you're doing a $1,000 catch-up on your IRA, do that catch-up on your 401k. That catch-up on your 401k is another 7500 bucks. Sure. So you could put thirty grand in a Roth 401k, mm -hmm. 7500 into a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. and really set yourself up so that a lot of your retirement nest egg is growing in this Roth. And then when you withdraw that to supplement Social Security out there in retirement, a much favorable calculation when determining whether Social Security is taxable. That's right. Uh, you don't have required minimum distributions on that Roth account. They don't make you pull the money out. Roth IRA. Roth IRA. Thank yes. you. Um, the, the other question that often comes up uh, related to the Roth conversion is, well, how much am I allowed to convert each year? And the answer is, how much tax pain can you tolerate in that year, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you're choosing how much money you're going to pull out of the IRA and move over to the Roth. In most circumstances, that's a taxable event. It's going to result in income landing on your tax return. And you get to kind of peg where do you want your income to ultimately land. And uh, for us, it's it's kind of a study of where what tax bracket do you want to be in. And you may take yourself right up to the edge of a tax bracket and not jump further into the next one because this is a great opportunity for you to pay some tax early, pay it now on your own time, your own terms, and avoid the tax in the future. And what we're saying is not only does it avoid tax in the future, it may help you avoid having your Social Security be countable on the tax return in the future. Yeah. And this is where the question is, Who's helping you with your tax planning? Yeah, right. Because this is a chess strategy. This is not checkers. This is, it, it, actually, it's 3D chess. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And, and there's actually a little bit 
more to it because there's some advanced strategies we're going to share with you next uh, with with Roth conversions, late in retirement, and and how that impacts when you draw Social Security and so on. So we're going to share a little bit of that. But it's not just the Roth. There's other ways that you can set yourself up to not pay tax on your Social Security out there in the future. We're going to share those ideas and more. That more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. And more and more. And, and uh, more. Uh, more mores. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and more. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I want to talk about the strategy uh, that when they, oftentimes the light bulb clicks or you start getting serious about retirement, it starts coming into focus late 50s, early 60s. And you're starting to see when I think I can be done or when I want to be done, what's this going to look like? And it's certainly not everyone or even the majority, but there's a handful of people that look and say, okay, I'm aware of you know the benefits of the Roth now. How can we really start leveraging that? Mm-hmm. And you draw in a strategy that is maxing that Roth, doing some Roth conversions and so on, um, and delaying Social Security a little bit so that the ratio between pre-tax and Roth in your overall retirement nest egg switches. Mm -hmm. And you get to a point where your pre-tax dollars, a required minimum distribution on those would be low enough that it wouldn't pull your Social Security on your tax return. Or if it did, just a little bit and your standard deduction, as long as things don't revert back to where they were, would be enough, and you're in the 0% tax bracket. And assuming you don't inherit an IRA from someone else that... Yeah, uh, right. I, I mean, that's a good monkey wrench, but uh, it, it would change that calculation on you in a hurry. Oh, absolutely. You have to start pulling money out of that inherited IRA. But, but I mean, that, that oh, I mean, something like this or this very thing is sort of what led to this multi-year tax projection yeah. Uh, approach of, well, okay, wait a second, you're 59. We know you're going to retire in four years. We know where you're going to start drawing money from. We have an idea as when you, it would make sense to draw Social Security. All right, let's, let's stage all of this out from a tax standpoint. And we know today where your potential beneficiaries are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, of these never been taxed dollars, who, who's the best person to pay tax on them? Yeah. And and at what rate what's the what's the what's the greatest volume of dollars at the lowest possible rate and how do we figure that out? All right. So, that was very long. The third segment. Let's start. That wasn't the third segment. No. Let's let's hit <laughs> that and then get into HSA as well. So. All right. You comment? No. You're looking at me like you got uh. <laughs> All right. Here we go. What are the things that you can do to set yourself up to not pay tax on your Social Security out there in retirement? That's what we're helping with right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on podcast. Wherever you listen, search the Wise Money Show. Subscribe or follow us there and, and rate the program there as well. We appreciate that. All right. So Social Security, most people... Close to 60% of recipients have to pay tax on their Social Security. And it's a very strange calculation that depends on what are your other taxable income sources in retirement. Add all that up, plus half your Social Security. And if it's above certain thresholds, then a very low threshold, then your Social Security starts becoming taxable. So the point is, well, what can you do right now? What can you do right now to set yourself up so you, you have a favorable calculation? So very little of your Social Security lands on your tax return, if any at all. And the, I mean, the one thing that, or one of the things that really can help you leverage this is the Roth IRA. So a strategy that we've helped a lot of people with, this isn't the majority, it doesn't, it doesn't fit for everyone, but I'll just share with you a little scenario. And that is, uh, by the time you get into your mid fifties, late fifties, retirement starts becoming more real. You take your planning of your finances potentially more serious than you did in the past. And you're starting to see, all right, this is how much we've saved up. This is our lifestyle. All right. How do we, what's the plan? 
And working with your certified financial planner that's doing comprehensive financial planning, we do this you know, all the time, start staging out, okay, we've got a few years left of income and then here's where you'll, you know, when you'll draw social security and here's how much you'll need to supplement your social security with, with withdrawals from your retirement dollars and blah, blah, blah. And that sometimes can reveal a strategy, a runway where, okay, if we start doing some Roth contributions and Roth conversions, and maybe delay Social Security a year or two. And of course, you got to plan for that too, right? That's not just a flippant decision. But but oftentimes, that's part of the consideration. Where over that time, you can get enough money into the Roth side of, of your accounts where it's a larger portion than your pre-tax. And therefore, for the rest of retirement, as you draw money out of your retirement nest egg, very little of it lands on your tax return because very little is pre-tax. And therefore, you're in a situation where very little of your Social Security becomes taxable or none of it at all. That's right. And, and that's just presuming, presuming that you're drawing proportionately out of the Roth IRA and the traditional IRA each year. But th this is one of the most important tax planning decisions that you're going to make in retirement. Where are you going to draw your income from? And from year to year, if you have both after tax dollars, already tax money, and never been tax money, you get to choose which bucket you're going to draw from, and you are having a direct impact on uh, what kind of income is going to land on your tax return. And in today's discussion, we're also equating that to how much of your Social Security is going to be counted on the return as well. That's right. That's right. All right. So the Roth IRA makes a ton of sense. The Roth 401k makes a ton of sense. Uh, doing Roth conversions may make a ton of sense. You've got to work with your certified financial planner each year, looking at your tax picture and saying, well, which one makes the most sense, especially in light of this? This is sort of the idea that sort of sparked the multi-year tax projection, where it's not just looking at this year. Let's stage out what the next several years look like and determine well, should we do pre-tax or Roth today? Should we do a Roth conversion today? How does that set you up for the future? The Roth IRA, though, and the Roth 401k isn't the only strategy that you can use to put yourself in a position where you avoid paying tax on your Social Security in the future. The other one is the health savings account, the HSA. What's the approach there, guys? Well, the health savings account is truly the Swiss Army knife of financial planning tools. And so you want to figure out, first of all, am I eligible to contribute to an HSA? Mm -hmm. And we've, <laughs> it's amazing um, how such a simple concept is so complex in the execution. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easier to get it wrong than you might think because you say, well, uh, I own the business and I'm going to contribute to my HSA through payroll just like everyone else. If you own more than 2% of the business, that'd be the wrong answer. <laughs> and so, and and then and there are all sorts of rules like this, which is why you want someone understanding, because the the problem is the problem with the Roth IRA, and Roth conversions, all that stuff. If you make decisions in a vacuum, or you make them one, you know, just based on one year's data, um, you might be making a, a big mistake. Yeah. So so back to the HSA. So that's a an an account that I can contribute to. If I have a high deductible health insurance plan, so a lot of times when I'll ask a client, "Well, what do you what what do you have as far as health insurance goes?" and they'll say, "I have an HSA," which is kind of true. It's it it, it, they, it might be true they have an HSA, but that's not what their health insurance is. Mm -hmm. And high deductible, well, that's that's in the eye of the beholder because <laughs> um, I was meeting with some folks last night, they have a $4,000 deductible and it's not a high deductible health plan. It's not HSA eligible. So there are certain uh, parameters that determine whether my health insurance through work or if I'm self-employed or what have you is eligible. And I, I think human resources departments and employers are, are really pretty good at making sure you know whether or not your plan is HSA eligible. I think these have been around long enough and people recognize the, the benefit of having an HSA eligible uh, health insurance plan. 
And and that way you're actually taking advantage of using the HSA itself. The HSA itself is just an account, could be at a bank, could be with a uh, an investment company where you're setting aside dollars before taxes out of your paycheck or out of your checking account. You can do it a couple different ways. You get it into that account, tax-free money going in. It doesn't get taxed while it's in there. And as long as you pull it out for qualified medical expenses, it comes out tax-free as well. Mm-hmm. There are not many places in the tax code where you're given an opportunity to completely avoid being taxed on an uh, on dollars. It, it's usually a, an offer to either tax you now or tax you later, yeah, right? Right, right? But this is tax you neither. And so an HSA is a pretty powerful tool. And um, it, it, you know, I always say, if you're going to have medical expenses, you at least want to be paying for those out of tax-free dollars if you can. Yeah. Right? So why are we talking about this? I mean, this is a health savings account, not a retirement account, right? Possibly. Yeah. So you, you have to determine, based on your budget, is the money that I put into my HSA on an annual basis going to go in and come out? So I got, I put it in, I reduced my taxable income, and then I pulled it out to pay for the dentist and the eye doctor and the yeah, like real time, right? Mm-hmm. As they're as they're yep. incurred, as I go, or I'm going to accumulate dollars in my HSA. And so if you're going to, so to me, it's either a spending HSA or a savings HSA, and they look the same. So mm-hmm. it's not like it's it would be a different label if you're opening an account. So you have that, and the savings HSA, you might want to consider investing those dollars for the long term. If, they, if, if you decide, this is a paradigm shift, and it will hurt your feelings. Sort of like uh, doing a Roth conversion hurts, hurts your feelings. You know, your CFP explains, uh, okay, this money, this money sitting over here, it's you know, safe and sound, not, not being taxed. What if we add it to your tax return this year, and you'll have this much tax you'll need to pay? Sometimes that is met with some pretty strong emotions. Okay, <laughs> um, but such you know the same is if you say, okay, well let's fund your HSA, but then not use it. Well, I I know it, but I don't, I don't know if little Timmy's gonna you know break his arm this year or you know get tonsillitis or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I know. But when all those expenses come up, don't touch this money. Yeah, that can be met with some resistance as well. But if you get over that emotional hump then what you do is you're basically saying, these HSA dollars, I'm not going to use them in the short term. I'm going to save them up for the long term. And instantly, that's not a prediction about, well, is the market going to go up or down? No, no, no. It's, well, if this money, if I'm not going to touch this money for the long term, I don't even know what the market's going to do in the short term. But over the long term, it tends to go up more predictably than really anything else. Therefore, if this money... My HSA dollars are now long term. I should invest them as if they're long term. Right. And and all those receipts, sorry, Josh, to, to cut you off, but all those receipts, all those uh, expenses that you paid out of pocket along the way, instead of drawing them out of your HSA, you can actually shoebox those. You can save them up. I do it digitally. And then you've got a record of here's all the money that I could have taken out of my HSA that I didn't. And believe it or not, the IRS does not have a statute of limitations on when you can reimburse yourself for those. And you could reimburse yourself for that in retirement, pulling dollars out tax-free. There's more to this strategy. We've got that more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Did it again. Did it again. Hmm. Did what? More, more. More coming up and more. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. We were getting close and it was like, well, I want to... No. I didn't know what you were brewing in your head, if it was a quick comment or... All right, so fourth segment, let's stay on this and then talk about other strategies or... Okay. Yeah. Capital losses. I think we need to talk more about the HSA. I think we've just started Sure. this, so... Mm-hmm. Four <clears throat> um, and we could even get into pitfalls, like things you need to watch out for, be aware of, and that could be, you know, realizing capital gains or inheritance or something like that. So I think there's meat on the bones. Okay. 
Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online, wisemoneyshow.com. And then wherever you're at on social media, we're pretty much there as well. Search the Wise Money Show. Follow us there and stay up to date on everything. All right. We're talking about a unique planning uh, strategy. And re- really, this is, well, back in 1983, they changed the laws and now... And at that point, some of your Social Security up to 50% could land on your tax return. And then in 1993, they added to that and said, no, 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 we're adding another threshold that if your income exceeds this, this calculated income formula, then up to 85% of your Social Security would be would become taxable. And, and that's never changed. Mm-hmm. Those numbers, those thresholds that maybe were appropriate back in the 80s and 90s, they've never changed. And so more and more and more people are having to pay tax on their Social Security. So how can you not pay tax on your Social Security? What can you do right now? Planning is really all about being proactive and thinking ahead about where you're going financially and what you what the, re, the result is that you're looking for. What can you do today to reach that result? I would love to draw Social Security if it's there and not have to pay any tax on it. That would be fantastic. It's a possibility. What can you do? One is leverage the Roth IRA, advantage Roth. It doesn't mean that the, you know, blindly the Roth makes sense in all circumstances. Absolutely not. But this is one of the advantages. The other is if you're eligible to contribute to an HSA, thinking and treating your HSA as a long-term account, as a retirement account, as opposed to something you're going to tap in the short term to cover medical expenses. Guys, more, more to that. What's, what's, you know, what kind of next levels with that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an advanced technique to think of an HSA as a retirement vehicle. A lot of people just think of this as a reimbursement account for medical expenses during your working career. If I've got a bill uh, this year, I could pay it out of this HSA that I've funded, and I, I'm using tax-free dollars to do it, which is a win for sure. But we're, we're suggesting that this could be a strategy for you to build yet another bucket of money for retirement that you can draw off of. And as you draw it out, as long as you're using it to reimburse yourself for qualified medical expenses out there in the future, could be a medical expense you had today, but you're going to reimburse yourself when you're 65, let's say. Um, when you draw that out in retirement, you don't have to count that as income which means it's not going to have an adverse effect on whether or not your Social Security gets taxed along the way. That's right. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this is another bucket that you can contribute to that's gotten bigger also. You know, individuals are allowed to, here in 2023, contribute 3850 bucks, and you double that number uh, to $7,750. Um, and that's the family. That, that's a pretty meaningful increase from last year. Yeah. You know, they had been just kind of ratcheting it up about a hundred bucks a year. And now all of a sudden it leaped forward by $450 in, in one year. So, Don't forget the catch up. That's right. If you're over age 55, you're allowed to contribute an extra thousand dollars as well. And it's age 55, not age 50, because they're just mean. Yeah, that's right. They're just, they're just no, because the, that makes total sense. Yeah. <laughs> because if you started planning on do, do making the extra savings at 50, there's an account that you got to wait till 55. Now, <laughs> right. a, a c- couple of things to, well, at least one other thing to hit as kind of a warning with the HSA. The HSA actually can be a retirement account. Uh, again, things that really don't make sense. Your HSA, any dollars that you have in it at, at age 65 or after, you can withdraw those for, for anything. It doesn't have to be, med- be medical related, but it's treated like an IRA distribution mm-hmm. at that point. Pay tax All, yeah, you've got to include it as taxable. So therefore, that's why we're talking about, well, you could reimburse yourself out there in retirement for medical expenses you incur today. You can also pay for certain medical, qualifying medical expenses out there in the future. You know you're going to have expenses in retirement for, for, for health-related things. You can even reimburse yourself for Medicare Part B, Part D, those sorts of things. So your HSA... You will have medical expenses out there, and you can also reimburse yourself. So I guess here's the thing. Imagine, I'm not suggesting that this is what you should do. Imagine if right now you started contributing the maximum amount to your 401k Roth side. And if you had additional kind of goal achievement dollars, you maxed out your Roth IRA. 
And then imagine, in addition, you were eligible to contribute to an HSA and you maxed out your HSA and you didn't touch it. Think of how much money you've just set aside for your financial future and all of it in a way that as you pull it out in the future, you're not going to pay tax on those dollars or it it's not going to cause your social security to become taxable. That's a pretty powerful, Mm -hmm. powerful approach. I mean, it has enough appeal and I I like that word power. There's strength in getting to retirement and having access to some pretty significant tax-free money. Um, To me, there's so much appeal that you have to plan around this. Right. You, You have to make the decision on how much money goes into the Roth, whether you're contributing it or converting it, doesn't matter, either option. It has to be done in the context of a tax projection, because what you don't know is you you don't want to listen to us on the radio and and say, man, they've they've persuaded me. They convinced me. Roth is the only way to go because it's going to be so, so good in the future. You may actually end up paying more in tax today than what it's worth, or you may um, forego some tax savings today because you let your income creep just a little too high. And so this is this is one of those situations where. You want to make your choices today with today's tax implications in mind and all the years between here and when you're going to spend those dollars. That's right? exactly right. Yeah. And so think of a scenario. I'm a high income, lots of earning. I put the 90, is it 9750 for uh, two people in the HSA? Yeah, that if, would be yeah, if they're over age yeah, 55. Yeah, so I put, I put 9750 in. I'm racking up money in my HSA. And you say, well, what after 65, I don't want to pull it out and pay taxes on it. Okay, well, pull it out. If you're high income and you you end up high income into retirement, you're you it's possible that you're paying close to $500 per person for your Medicare Part B. Think a thousand bucks a month. Well, that that adds up you can use your HSA to reimburse you for your Medicare Part B costs. Isn't that so crazy? So you're when you're in retirement and on Social Security, there's no choice. You have to pay your Medicare Part B premium out of your Social Security. It has to come right out of it. Mm-hmm. However, you're allowed to reimburse yourself from your HSA for your Medicare, your Medicare Part B. If you're paying for a supplement plan, that doesn't come out of your Social Security. you got to pay that out of pocket. Oh, but you can't pay your supplement from your HSA. It, it's, mm-hmm. it's illogical. does not make sense. You know, it just underscores the complexity of the tax code, though, because it's not like all those laws were written at the same time, right? There's, there's like a layer upon layer of rules, and they're changing rules and so on, and they don't always go back and go fix or true up these rules. And so you can have some gotchas built in there, some some traps, and also some opportunities. Yeah. And so to me, this, again, it just underscores the importance of you having tax planning being a part of your overall financial planning initiative. So a couple of gotchas if you're pursuing this strategy that we've talked about. Well, if you're contributing to your, your 401k um, Roth side, you're getting a match, and as of right now, they're still not letting that match be a Roth match. Right. Okay, that was in the proposal for a Secure Act 2.0. Hasn't been passed yet at the time of this recording. So if you want to make sure that your 401k doesn't have any, any pre-tax dollars, you could convert that match every single year. You'd need to be, you'd need to be aware of that. What are some other pitfalls? You know, a potential pitfall um, in all of this is you could be doing some amazing planning throughout your life and getting yourself ready for um, being maximum like control, I guess, having maximum control on the Social Security uh, taxation, on your overall tax picture when you get to retirement. And then you may have this blessing just dropped in your lap. You may inherit some dollars that have never been taxed, and now you're going to have to count them as income. And all of a sudden, you've got this monkey wrench that you didn't didn't see coming. First of all, don't be begrudging in receiving yeah. a wonderful blessing like that. But just recognize, sometimes life throws you some curveballs. And that's why the tax planning you're doing throughout your working career has to continue into retirement. That's right. You have to be nimble, be adjusting, work with your certified financial planner to make sure that you're taking advantage of all the rules that exist today and out there in the future. That's right.
That's right. All right, I hope that helps. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, all of us at Corhorn Financial Group, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.